Hallelujah. Yes, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, God. We praise your name. You're worthy, King Jesus. You're worthy of the glory and the honor, Lord. There's no one like you in all the earth, oh God. We exalt you, O oh God. We worship at your footstool. We magnify you, King Jesus. You are great. You're sovereign and you're holy, Lord God. There's no one like you in all the earth, oh God. We glorify you, King Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From the rise of the sun to going down the same, your name is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you. We bless you. Worthy is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Bless your name, God. Yes, Lord God, you are so worthy, King Jesus. There's no one like you, Lord, in all the earth. Hallelujah. You are sovereign. You're holy. You are majestic. You are righteous, God, in all your ways. There's no one like you in all the earth, oh God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. King Jesus, you reign in majesty, dominion, and authority. Bless your name, O oh God. We glorify you, Lord. Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. Your word declares all the earth shall worship you, sing praises to your name, O Most High. You are the Most High God, and we honor your name, O God. We call upon the name of Jesus. We honor your presence, Lord God. There's no one like you in all the earth. King Jesus, you are the living word. You're the fountain of life. You're the bread of heaven, God. You're the author finisher of our faith. You are the good shepherd, the bishop of our souls, O God. We bless you today, O God. We praise you for who you are. Magnify you, King Jesus. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in this evening. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, have your way in us today. Holy Spirit, fill this atmosphere with your presence. We praise you, Lord God. You are awesome and mighty, sovereign and holy, Lord God. You reign in majesty, dominion, and, and splendor. You have all power and authority in your hands, O oh God. We exalt you, Lord God. We glorify you. Hallelujah. Well, good evening, everybody. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Tuesday night Bible class. We were supposed to have it at the church today, but I didn't have the assistance that I need to help with the live stream at the church. So decided to continue to do it from home today and next week we will be in the church the lord says we'll be in the church building next week tuesday at six o'clock but i pray that these lessons are enriching to your soul and, and giving you strength to endure the persecution the trials and tests that you go through in your own daily walk so as you you know trust god god will continue to carry you through every obstacle every trial every attack every assault the enemy brings against you and just remember no weapon formed against you going to prosper. Because the Lord is on your side, who can stand against you? Amen. So let's go into a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, I thank you this evening for this opportunity to share your word once again. I thank you, Lord God, for your presence in our midst. I thank you, O oh God, for your love and kindness that drawn us to yourself every day, O oh God that we lay our lives down before you as living sacrifices, that we have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church, that the Word of God will convict, 
reprove and correct us, O oh God, to make us better in our everyday walk with you, O oh God. We ask you to forgive us for our sins, knowing unknowingly, Father God, cleanse our minds and hearts, O oh God, from all unrighteousness today, that we have nothing to hinder us, O oh God, from receiving from you the engrafted word that has the power, Father God, to bring us to a heart of meekness and compassion, that we, Father, would be able to feed off your word tonight, O oh God, that we would grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise, O oh God, for what you have done in our lives thus far, even for this day, O oh God, how you brought us through. Father, you protected us, O oh God. Many people, they've gone to work in many different destinations. You dispatch angels to be around, O oh God, as a shield and a buckler. And tonight, God, I ask that you would minister to all of our hearts, O oh God, and help us to stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free. We give you glory, give you honor, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you for tuning in tonight for the TNBC Tuesday Night Bible Class. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I, I had a wonderful, relaxing day studying God's Word and just, just resting on today. Sometimes you just got to take a moment to just rest. We get so busy doing many different things and we get distracted, but we don't spend time in the presence of the Lord. And I found out that when you neglect God, you neglect from hearing him speaking into your heart, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, giving you guidance, giving you counsel, giving you the strength you need because you're not paying attention. But I found out when we get to the place where we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and we labor before him, studying his word, just meditating on his presence, God will begin to fill you. He will fill you with his presence like never before. And you'll find a peace like you never had before, just resting in your heart. And you'll feel the glory of God filling your atmosphere around you. I tell you what a beautiful experience when, when God's glory come into your house and begin to fill the atmosphere like he did in the days of old when he filled the tabernacle. When God comes in, everything else has to flee. That's not like God. Even people. I found this to be so true. When you take a moment to invite God into your house, your physical house and your spiritual house, people who can't get with it, they're going to leave because they, they, it's, it's strange fire to them. But when you know that you're connected in the spirit with the Lord God Almighty, it doesn't matter who's with you or who's against you because God is on your side. It doesn't matter because he keeps you secure in his presence every day. So tonight we're starting in chapter 7. Chapter 7 of the bait of Satan living free from deadly traps of offense. The bait of Satan living free from the deadly traps of offense. And last week, um, I asked those who were attending in the church if they wanted to get a book. I did order the books, and the books have been advanced to where it also has a DVD included in the book. That's something I never had before in the past. But I thank God for his presence leading me in wisdom to get this book few years ago and study this book and now the book is being being power packed in all of our lives because it's given us an insight to examine our hearts to see what's in our lives that should not be there and allow the spirit of the living god to purge it out of us and i tell you when you learn how to listen to the voice of the spirit of god you, you avoid a lot of issues a lot of things that we find ourselves engulfed in could be avoided if we learn how to be patient and wait on God and listen. Many times when we don't listen to God, situations become boisterous in our lives. Things get chaotic in our lives because we're not listening to the instruction from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is such a perfect gentleman, he's not going to violate your will, but he gives you the opportunity to lead you in wisdom and in truth. And the truth is God's word. That's why I love about the full armor of God, because the first part of that armor is putting on the belt of truth. Because if you don't have your foundation built on truth, you're going to follow a lie the enemy brings into your life through any avenue he presents it to you. 
Just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan talked to Eve at the tree of good and evil and persuaded them to do what God told them not to do. Let's eat from that tree. And they ate from that tree, both of them. Their eyes became open and sin entered into their hearts. And God had to expel them from the Garden of Eden because sin had entered into their hearts. And he knew if they had to stay there in the Garden of Eden after eating of that tree, it would, there would have been an eternal sinful lifestyle in, in the garden. But God had a remedy. He put them out, provided a ram in the bush, not only that, he brought us salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the reason why we're here as benefactors of the new, new nature, the new life that's found in getting a revelation of who Jesus is. I was reading earlier today how many times when kings disobeyed God, they brought judgment on the whole kingdom. Not only that, one king named Ahab, God told him, I'm going to put a lying spirit in all your prophets. And they're going to speak just what I want, want them to speak because you're not obeying me. And that's one thing about God. God will let the enemy have his way in your life when you continue to be consistently walking in rebellion and disobedience. That's a message to somebody tonight, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. What we learn in the presence of God cannot be learned in the presence of men. What we learn in the presence of God, pay attention, we cannot be learned, it cannot be learned in the presence of men. Because when you spend time in the presence, there's a rhema word, a revelation that comes from the deep wells of knowledge, from the spirit, and begins to convey to you a divine word from the heart of God specifically for you. And you cannot learn that word from men. You can only get inspiration from men, encouragement from men, but the revelation comes from God. One of the commentaries says, I have been reading the bait of Satan. My view of God's word has been changed ever since. I gone through something that was very painful and it had not been, if it had not been for the message of the book, I might have been trapped for eternity. And this is by uh, a person in FN Malaysia, giving a, a, a commentary of how this book changed, changed their life. The sure foundation, the subject tonight starting in chapter 7, is the sure foundation. Also, you can find this book, if you don't have the book, you can find this book on YouTube in an audible form. It's in an audible form on YouTube. And it's by John Bevere. And it's the bait of Satan living free from deadly trust offense. So therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious stone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. And this is a prophetic word. Whoever would believe would not act hastily. A person who acts hastily is, un is an unstable person because his actions are not properly founded. This person is easily moved and swayed by the storms of persecution and trials. So when I trust in God, I believe in God's word, no matter what comes in my life, to test and try and prove me, I'm not going to be quick. We talked about this in previous lessons about being proactive versus reactive. I'm not going to be reactive when things happen in my life because those who trust God have a sure foundation. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So if you're resting on the foundation, that cornerstone, that precious cornerstone, that tried stone, which is Jesus Christ, when you're resting on him as your foundation, you're going to be patient and wait on God to give you a revelation on how to deal with certain situations in your life. The problem comes in when stuff happens to me, I don't listen to the voice of the Spirit of God. 
I listen to the voice of reason. I listen to my consciousness of the flesh that feeds me ideas and reasons how to deal with certain situations the way I choose to do it. So I get a choice based on my own reasonings to respond to certain things, not according to God's way, but according to the way of the flesh. Anyone got any questions or comments? Amen. So let's proceed. For example, let's look at what happened with Simon Peter. Jesus had entered into the region of Caesarea Philippi and asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am, the Son of Man am? Matthew chapter 16. If you got your Bibles available, go to Matthew chapter 16. Go to Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. So I hope you got your Bibles. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. It's a really good scripture. And it says, in the King James, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say the Son of Man am? And they said, verse 14, Some say, that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Okay? Disciples, you gotta understand, the disciples been with Jesus already for a long time. So they witnessed who he is, they heard him talk about who he is, <coughs> And now it's a test to see if they really believe who he is. So he said, but what he says in them, but whom say ye that I am? Right? Go to verse 16. And Simon Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and says unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Right? So, he got a revelation who Jesus was from the Father at this moment. He asked the question. No one could really answer the question, but Peter hastily spoke up. Hey, I got the answer. I know who you are. So Peter tells him, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responds, you didn't get this revelation on your own, but my Father in heaven gave you a revelation who revealed to you that you would know who I am. Several disciples, and through the actually shared the opinion of the crowd about who Jesus was. Jesus waited until they finished and then he looked at them and asked them point blank, but who do you say that I am? I'm sure there was a confused, fearful look on most of the disciples' faces as they pondered this, mouth open wide and speechless. Suddenly, the men who were so eager to speak, airing other opinions, were silenced. Perhaps they had, had uh, never seriously at they had never seriously been asked this question of themselves before. Whatever the case, now they realize they had no answer. And th there's something here. Because if you were someone in your life, a significant other, a spouse, a family member, and you know them. Why? Because I've been around them. I learned their characteristics. I learned their nature, what they like, what they don't like. I know who they are. And no matter what comes on in their life, or people come to try to tell me something contrary to who they are, because I know them, I have the right response. Oh, that's brother so-and-so, or that's my wife, or that's my husband, or that's my significant other, because I've been around them to know their character. I know their nature. I know their identity. So you can't sway me 
and tell me something contrary to what I already know about them. The disciples with Jesus were speechless. They gave their response. Some say Elias, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the prophets. There was their response. But they had no revelation of who Jesus was to them. And that's the reason why Jesus said again, but who do you say that I am? So we have to have a conviction in our hearts through salvation by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to know without a shadow of doubt, I know who Jesus is. Let me tell you about him. He's the one who gave his life on the cross. He died on that cross. He went in the grave three days. He stayed buried. And the third day he rose again with all power and authority in his hand. So I know who he is. And because of my own revelation I got from who he is and my own relationship, I have no doubt about who he is to me. Jesus did what he does so well. He located their hearts with a question. He brought them to true realization <coughs> of what they did not, what they did and did not know. And that's something. How God would test you to see where your heart is. I read this many times. I read it over and over and over. When it said he located their hearts with a question. So if God was to come to you tonight, my brother, my sister, and ask you a question, who am I to you? Do you really know me? Have you been with me so long and yet you still don't know me? Or do you really have a firm, rooted, grounded relationship in Jesus Christ? So if anyone asks you a question, who is he? You can tell them. He's the one when I was lost in sin. I was on my way to hell. I was about to commit suicide. I was a drunkard. I was a, a fornicator, adulterer. I was a liar. I was a thief. And one day I heard the voice of Jesus call me to himself through somebody who witnessed to me the gospel of salvation. And I was able to give my life to Jesus. And that's been 20 years ago. I gave my life to Jesus so I know who he is. And I'm still following him this very day. I'm serving him. I'm living for him. I'm telling us about Jesus. So if God asks you the question, you need to know for yourself. Many times you have people go to church week after week, Sunday after Sunday, attend Bible study, and still don't know who Jesus is. Because I'm going with head knowledge and not a heart knowledge. So I'm living by the appetite of the world with head knowledge, but I'm not feeding on the spirit of truth with spiritual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge versus, versus natural knowledge will not mix together. I need to make a decision on the inside of myself that either I'm going to live with the knowledge of truth or the knowledge of unrighteousness. Because I have to make a decision. He asked me a question. Who am I to you? And I need to know with, without a shadow of a doubt, without being speechless, I can speak up and say, Lord, I know who you are. When I was sick in the hospital, going through cancer, or I had diabetes, and I was going through this illness, and the doctors gave up on me, you showed up in my room, and you touched my life, and you healed me and delivered me. I need to know with a sure conviction of heart that I know who he is. My God, my God. Preach my own self happy on that one. He brought them to true realization of what they did and did not know. They were living off of speculations of others rather than establishing in their own hearts who Jesus really was. You have people in your core circle around you just because of what you can do for them. They can care less who you are. You can confess 
to you blue in the face. I'm a child of God. I'm, I've been living for Jesus for 30, 40, 50 years. And I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. And they don't care. The only thing they want is what you can do for them and not to bring them salvation. One thing I learned, young in ministry, I used to start on fence a lot. I could preach a real good message, but I started on the fence. Because I was part light, light and part darkness. And the more I straddled the fence, the more God convicted my heart. And the more he convicted my heart, the more I started feeling miserable in my daily living. So I started drinking. I started doing everything I can do to resolve the misery. And guess what the answer was? Surrenderance. The moment I told God, forgive me for I sinned against thee in heaven. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior and save me. Guess what? He came into my heart. He changed my life. Gave me a new mindset. Gave me a new attitude. Then my life began to change. And the anointing that was on the word I would preach was still there, but even greater, because now I'm surrendered to the anointing. You hear what I just said? I surrendered to the anointing. So the anointing compelled me to get into a place of consecration. The anointing compelled me to lay my life down as a living sacrifice before the living God. And when I got a revelation of who Jesus is to me, my life began to blossom in the things of God. So it's very important you don't live off the speculation of other people. You need to know who you are. And if you have to cut people off in your life because they mean you no good and you know they mean you no good, why well, keep playing around the devil's playpen? If you hang around people in the devil's playpen and you know you don't belong there, get out of it. Cut them off. Shut the door. Don't answer the phone because they have a hidden agenda to pull you from your relationship with Christ. Check this out. They had not confronted themselves. Until this moment, they never had a reality check to make them realize I need to confront who I am and who he is to me. Simon who was renamed Peter by Jesus, was the only one of the disciples who could answer. He blurted out, he hastened me. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, verse 16. Then Jesus responded to him, saying, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus was explaining to Simon Peter the source of this revelation. Peter had not received this knowledge by hearing the opinions of others or by what, was, what he was taught, but, but God had revealed to him who he was. That's a, another point. If you want to know who Jesus is, if you want to know who you are to Jesus, Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Fast and pray. Seek the face of God. And when you get to the place, Lord, reveal yourself to me. I want to know you. Paul wrote one of the scriptures. So I want to know you. I want to have fellowship with your, with your suffering. Be conformed to your death. Why? Because if I get intimate with Christ, I can feel the suffering he went through. But that suffering brings me joy that I don't have to suffer in the same frame of mind he suffered. So now when things happen to me, because of the relationship I have with him, I can now receive a peace of mind, a joy for my heart, his presence covers me because I'm in the right frame of mind by the Holy Spirit to receive the revelation 
on how to deal with suffering. Simon Peter was very hungry for the things of God. He asked the most questions. It was he who walked on the water while, while the other 11 watched. He was a man who would not settle for someone else's opinion. He wanted to hear directly from the mouth of God for himself. Are you like that tonight? Have a hunger and a deep thirst for God? Do you want to know him intimately? When nothing in this world would matter, people can't sway you otherwise from your belief in Christ Jesus. Simon Peter was that type of person. He's the one that asked questions when he didn't understand something about Jesus, what he was talking about, the parables. He was the one who said, Lord, if it's you, when he saw Jesus walking on the water and it looked like it was a ghost, everyone began to fear. And Jesus said, fear not for his eye. Peter was the one who said, Lord, if it's really you, then bid me to come to you to walk on the water. And Jesus said, come. And guess what? He had enough faith to do what the eleven wouldn't do, walk out the boat onto the water. Knowing that, he didn't care what people thought. Even when he began to sink, because he took his eyes off of Jesus and said when he saw the wind boisterous, he began to sink. And he said, Lord, save me. When you're in a place of desperation and you begin to cry out, Hallelujah. God hears your cry. He knows it's not an ordinary cry, a little wimpy cry. He knows it's a cry that says, Lord, I need you right now. And that's what we need to be in our own hearts, in our own personal conviction, our relationship with Christ, to know with confidence that when I call upon the name of the Lord, I will get an answer. Glory to God in the highest. And when things happen, that throws me for a loop. I can go to the hills. Which comes my help. For my help comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. So I know without a shadow of a doubt. I can always call on the Lord. He said you draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. So Peter. Like we need to be today. Wanted to hear God speak directly to him himself. This revealed knowledge of Jesus did not come by his own senses. But it was a gift illuminated in his heart in response to his hunger. Hear what I just said. This knowledge did not come by his own senses. Human senses is talking about. It was by the spirit of the living God. Because he had a hunger. Hunger. He had a desire for his heart to be illuminated to understand who Jesus is. Many had seen and witnessed what Simon Peter saw, but their hearts was not hungry to know the will of God that Peter was. Peter wanted to know God. He wanted to know relationship with Christ. He wanted to be in his presence. And he knew in himself if I can just hear his voice speaking to me a revelation, I can know that my heart is being settled to know who Jesus is. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, it says, But the anointing which ye have received from him abides in you, and you need not that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, it is true and it's not a lie. And just as it has taught you. So the same anointing that's in Christ Jesus is the same anointing that's inside of you and me. And it says because of the anointing, when you spend time in the presence of God, you don't need man to teach you. It's good to have a teacher, but it's better to get into the presence of God and let God teach you by the Holy Spirit. Men are in place, pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, 
all the different people are in position to help lead God and direct you into the wells of truth. And they only can do as much as you allow them to do in your life and receive from the Spirit of God. But it's up to you to take the teaching you learn from man to get into God's Word for yourself. Dissect that Word. Get that Word in your mindset and in your heart. And allow the Word to give you the insight and revelation of the Spirit of God. The anointing was teaching Simon Peter. He heard what everyone else had to say, and then he looked inward to what God had revealed. You hear what I just said? He heard what everyone had to say, but he looked inwardly to receive what God had revealed to him. Once you receive revealed knowledge from God, no one can sway you. Once you, once I, receive revelation from the Word of God by the Holy Spirit, no one can turn your belief system away from truth. No one can come to you with philosophies of men and false teachings and doctrines of men to turn you from truth. Because once the truth has been settled and rooted and grounded in you, guess what? It causes you to prosper and to flourish in the things of God. They cannot change your heart. No matter how persuading, no matter how manipulative they are, no matter how crafty and cunning they are, when you know within yourself the revealed knowledge of the Word of God and understanding from the Spirit of God, the truth of God's Word, they will not be able to turn you from truth. Jesus said to Simon Peter, and the rest of the disciples on this rock what rock the rock of knowledge revealed by God when Peter got the revelation it was the beginning of the foundation of the knowledge of God in the hearts of mankind he says I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. So once the rock, the foundation has been laid, everything else is built upon the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. So the knowledge of God was the revelation of who Jesus is. So when I get understanding, and I know without a shadow of doubt, I know who Jesus is, I'm going to stand on the word of truth. I'm going to put on the law and battle of truth. Put on a breastplate of righteousness. Put on the shoes of peace. Hold on the shield of faith. Put on the helmet of salvation. Hold a sword in my hand. Nothing can pull me from who Jesus is to me. They can't pull me away from it. Because I know who he is and what he's done in my life. How he changed my life. The next point we want to talk about is the illuminated word. The illuminated word. Glory to God in the highest. My, my, my. This is good. Anyone got any questions or comments? Any questions? That's right. Amen. Lights. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. He said, oh, I have often told the congregations and individuals when I am preaching to listen for God's voice within my voice. So often we are so busy taking notes that we only record everything that is said. This yields a mental understanding of what the scriptures and their interpretations, head knowledge. We just talked about that, head knowledge. I can understand so much about the word of God just from head knowledge, but not spiritual knowledge. When we possess solely head knowledge, two, two things happen. Check this out. This is good. I like this part. I read this over and over, and, and it makes a lot of sense. When we only receive head knowledge, two things happen. We're easily susceptible to the hype or emotionalism. We're easily susceptible to the hype or emotionalism of how the preacher's preaching how he's expounding on the word, 
how he's excited about the word. So I received nothing but a hype and emotional, emotional stirring up. Secondly, we are bound by intellect. We're bound by intellect. So I get stuck in a place of receiving intellect from the knowledge of the word, but no spirit encounter. So if I'm not receiving from the spirit of God, my head knowledge is nothing but knowledge. But when I tap into the spirit, I'm hearing the preacher expound on the word, preach the word to us. The word goes into my head because it goes to my ear gates. But it goes in the ear gates, gets into my heart. So once it gets in my heart, even though I'm writing notes, I can do this all the time. I'm sitting there listening, writing notes, and I'm hearing the spirit at the same time. And as I'm hearing the spirit from the message, for example, pastor spoke on Sunday, this past Sunday, about the walls of Jericho. And he talked about the different walls that people have in generational uh, curses and in relations and families. And he talked about how those walls are coming down. So I'm writing notes, but yet I can hear God speaking. And that's what we have to do a lot of times. It's okay to take notes. But you need to be listening while you're taking notes. Because there might be a truth that God is trying to convey to you concerning a situation you're dealing with in your own personal life. Or it's a habit or addiction he's trying to break off of you. But because you're not listening, you only hear the head knowledge. When I found out in all that getting get understanding. So when I get understanding from the head knowledge... I get the spiritual revelation, which gets into my heart, and it reveals to me that area of my life where I struggle the most, that God is trying to prune, prove, uproot, and tear down. Knowing that, the areas of my life, you need to build me. Because some people have been torn down for so long, they haven't given God the opportunity to rebuild them. And that's what God is saying tonight, that you might be in a, in a state of mind where you've been church hurt, you've been bro broken in relationships, you've been in a, a, a broken marriage that failed, you might have been on a job that fired you, might have lost your possessions, your house, your cars. And God needs to repair the brokenness. So the word tells us he heals the broken hearts and he binds their wounds. But God cannot fix anything broken if you do not give him permission. If I don't give God permission to come into here in my heart, I'm allowing myself to stay a broken vessel where God cannot mend together because I'm stuck in the mindset of failure. He what I just said. When you're in a broken state and you refuse to allow God to come in, you're stuck in a state of failure. And you never progress past it until you get a revelation in your heart. God, I need you to mend my brokenness, bind my wounds, come into my heart, fix me up, clean me up, and change me. Until I surrender... Change will never take place in my heart. When we listen to an anointed minister speak, when as we read a book, we should look for words or phrases that explode in our spirits, that dunamis power, an explosion. Jesus said this, but this is not the sure foundation on which Jesus built his church. He said it would be founded on the real Revealed word, not just memorized verses. The foundation, when Jesus told him, upon this rock, I will build my church. He was not talking about the foundation of human mindsets, or the foundation of human agenda, or the world. He was talking about the revealed revelation of the word of God in our hearts. I can memorize verses. Dozens, hundreds, but the word will have no impact in my life because all I receive 
It's just head knowledge from the word. But when the anointing is on the memorization of a scripture, there's something about that scripture that reminds me there's something about the name of Jesus that has the power to change my life and the lives of those around me, to impact my children's life, to impact my family's life, to change my generation, to cut off the bloodline of curses and brokenness from the enemy. And it reminds me of the love of God for my life. Now he loves me and it's by his loving kindness that he draw me to himself because of the anointing. This is the, the word of God is revealing to us. It conveys light and spiritual understanding. The word of God conveys light and spiritual understanding. Why? Because light illuminates. The word illuminate is light. God illuminates the darkness in your heart. He illuminates the habits in your life. He illuminates the lies in your mouth. He illuminates the thing that you've been trusting in that's not of God to reveal to you how much you need the Savior. One thing I remember my father taught when I was young in ministry, he talked about the, uh, the law, when the law was put in place in the Old Testament. He said the law was in place as a schoolmaster. What? What's a schoolmaster? Somebody to teach you. He said it was in place to teach us how much we need to learn to depend and rely on Jesus. But then it also reveals to us our own failures and mistakes and how much we cannot make it without Jesus. And he says when you get under the law, you're subject to the law. You have to obey the law. He said, but when you come under grace, Jesus took the requirements of the law off of, off of you, put it on himself, and fulfilled the law because he knew we couldn't keep it. And that's revelation. Because when you know that things in your life that you're doing, that you can't break it, you can't stop, you can't quit, cigarettes, some are bound with cigarettes, and they just can't quit. You know why you can't quit certain habits and addiction in your life? You haven't fully surrendered. God gave me that revelation a few days ago. I was sitting there reading something. And he said, you know, the reason why people are stuck in a Jericho wall, he said, because they refuse to fully surrender to my lordship and my authority. So they make excuses. Oh, I can't quit because of this habit or because of that. But when I learned how to fully allow the Spirit of God to take over, the Spirit of Truth comes in here and tells me, you don't need that drugs, you don't need that alcohol, you don't need that cigarette, you don't need that fornication, you don't need that adultery, you don't need that, those, those different habits that you've been doing. He said, you can live free. Because he who the Son, which the Son of God, has set free is what? Truly free indeed. You can be free from anything, being selfish, being stingy, being prideful, being arrogant, being haughty. You can be free from the influence of the enemy in your life when I say, Lord, I surrender all. Glory to God. When I surrender all to his lordship and his authority, he takes the requirements and the punishment of sin off of my life. That I have it, it has to break. That I have it, it has to go. That stronghold has to be destroyed because of the anointing. If the word says, yokes are destroyed because of the anointing. And burdens are lifted off of your shoulders because of the word. So we got to get to the place we recognize I can't fix this in my own strength. So you need to get around other people who are stronger than you who dealt with the same habit, dealt with the same issue, where they can tell you their testimony. 
how God delivered them. That's why the word says, and they overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, loving not their lives even unto death. Because it's the word. We just talked about it a few minutes ago. The word is the foundation of revelation that sets you free from habits and addictions. Psalms 119 verse 130. Psalms 119 verse 130. The entrance of thy word, O Lord, giveth light. The entrance of thy word giveth light and giveth understanding to the simple. Why? Because the word has the power, dunamis power, explosiveness to come into your life to shatter those habits and addictions. To break those chains off your mind. To loose those shackles off your feet. To get you back on straight street. On the destiny to fulfill that God has for you to walk in. Glory to God in the highest. It's not based on your mind. That illuminates and clarifies. It's the word. Often a minister may be speaking on one subject. Yet God has illuminated something totally different in my own heart. On the other hand, God may anoint the exact words of the minister and they explode within me. Either way, it is revealed word of God to me. This is what changed us from being simple, void of understanding. And that's what simple is. Being void of of understanding. So it says the angels of our word give us light and give understanding to the simple, those who are void of understanding. The illuminated word in our hearts is the foundation Jesus said his church would be grounded on. Glory to God's time. Show getting away from me. My God, my God, my God. So the word of God is the foundation that Jesus was talking about. He's going to build his church. And guess what? You and I are that church. Every born again believer. Every child of God. Who claimed to be a child of God. Is founded on the foundation. Of Jesus Christ. The word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Jesus. St. John chapter 1, verse 1. The Word is Jesus Christ. The revelation of who Jesus is is the foundation that our lives need to be built upon every day. Jesus compared the unveiled Word of God to a rock. A rock speaks of stability and strength. I like that. The rock speaks of stability and strength. That is so good. So if I stand on a rock, you go down to the lakefront here in Milwaukee, they have an area where there's these large boulders. And the boulders ain't moving. No matter how much you push on it, you can stand on it, the rock is not going to move. Why? Because it's stable and it's strong. And nothing you can do to break that rock. Hit it with a hammer, it's not going to break. Because it's so solid. And that's where your faith, my faith need to be. Rested on the rock. We recall the parable of the two houses. With one built on the rock and the other on the sand. When adversities, check this out. When adversities such as persecutions, tribulations, and afflictions. Storm against both houses. The one built on sand was destroyed while the house built on the rock stood. Where's your foundation today? That's a question you need to check yourself with tonight. Are you standing on the foundation of the rock? Are you on sinking sand? Many people claim to be a child of God, claim to be living on the word of truth until tests come. Tests would prove you 
See, if you really real with yourself, are you really relying on Jesus? Or have you been living according to the dictates, the leadership of the human flesh, the mind of the flesh? Or have you really been founded upon the rock of revelation? So when things happen, trials came, situation arose in your life beyond your control, sickness afflicted your body, tribulations came against you, everything can go wrong was going wrong in your life, persecution started coming from every side. The word tells us, even when these things happen, nothing can separate it from the love of Christ. So if I'm resting on the foundation of Jesus Christ, it don't matter what happens. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. We're going to close at this point. We'll pick it up next week. The illumination of the word. Because when the word illuminates, the word exposes, the word reveals, the word begins to show your faults and your failures until you repent. But when you repent, God cleanses you from all unrighteousness as if you never done anything wrong. The word tells the first John 1 9, first John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all. It didn't say partial. It didn't say some of it. It didn't say a little bit. But all unrighteousness. Only is predicated on when you have a conviction of heart, a repentful heart, to tell God, I messed up. I made a mistake. I lied. I did this or I did that. Forgive me. You have to be real with God. God already knows what you've done. So you got to come to God clean. Why? Because I come clean. He said, let us draw near to God with a heart full of faith, being washed clean from evil conscience. So if I come to God, say, God, I adulterated, I fornicated, I lied, I stole, I mistreated my neighbor, I did this, I did that, forgive me. God said, you know what? The blood of Jesus has washed you clean. So you might be one tonight who dealing with a habit of addiction and you've been struggling and been trying to figure out your situation. Things are going chaotic in your life. You're losing your house. You lost your job. You lost your car. Things that can go wrong is going wrong in your life. God says tonight, if you come to me, I'll come to you. I'll meet you right where you are. So we confess our sins. He is faithful. And just forgive us our sins, cleanse from all the righteousness. It might be something heaven you never even done wrong, haven't done anything wrong, and things are happening. He don't understand why. Because in this life, Jesus made it clear to the disciples, you're gonna suffer persecution, but don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. For I already overcame the world. So when persecution comes, he tells us that my strength will be made perfect in his strength. To give you the ability and the power to overcome. If you're on tonight, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You might even be a backslider. I want you to do this. Do me a favor. Pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I have sinned against thee, and thee only have I sinned. And done this evil in thy sight. Come into my heart. And forgive me. And cleanse me. From all unrighteousness. Now come into my life. And be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you. For saving me. In Jesus name I pray. Amen.
If you are one who prayed that prayer, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that has come to Christ. Even a backslider, they rejoice over you because you made a choice and a decision to come back home. It's like the prodigal son who left his home with his, his inheritance and squandered it, lived a righteous life, life and lost his inheritance, lost everything he had. But he came to himself and came back home. God is rejoicing with the angels over you who made that choice to come back home tonight. So if you want to sow a seed into the ministry, the link is on tonight as well. It's, it's tagged on to the, to the screen. If you want to sow a seed into the ministry, feel free to do so. Don't allow the enemy to hinder you from sowing your seed because your seed is an avenue to open up the blessings for you that God has for you. People don't realize that. He said, you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. And that's a true statement. I'm a living witness. It works. The word works. When I give beyond my expectation to give, God bless me tremendously every single time. You might need God to do something in your life tonight. Don't be afraid to sow a seed. You sow your seed. Sow with an expectation that God is going to turn your situation around in your favor. God will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You don't have enough room to receive. I've seen it happening in my life and lives of many others that I've sown seeds into. And I guarantee when you be obedient to the voice and spirit of God, God will begin to bless you tremendously. We're going to close. And the Lord says the same. We'll resume again next week, Tuesday, for our weekly Bible study. We're going to plan, the Lord says the same, to be at the church next week, next week, Tuesday. We're going to resume at the church next week, Tuesday, while I do live stream there. The Lord says the same. Now, I pray you stay encouraged, stay excited. I see many of you on here, my family and some friends and loved ones. God bless you all. Thank you for tuning in. I pray this has been an eye-opening for you tonight as well for myself. Anyone have any questions or comments? Any questions? Because I don't want to ever leave without answering your question. Because we all have something we need God to do in our lives. And we may not understand how to do it or what to do to make it happen. But I encourage you tonight, take a moment, even if it's 20 minutes, to just find you your favorite scripture. Begin to read that scripture until it gets in your spirit. And then pray and ask God to give you revelation. Spend time in the presence of the Lord. And when you do that, God will show up in your life and set you free from the inside out. From the inside out, God will set you free. Habits will break off your life. Addictions will be broken. Strongholds will be broken. Burdens will be lifted off your shoulders from the inside out. Because of the obedience to follow Jesus all the days of our lives. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this word tonight, O oh God. Pray that I have my Father for deaf ears. Pray that you touch every heart. Change every life, O oh God. Convict us all of sin and iniquity. Things in our hearts that we know that shouldn't be there, God, that you purge it out tonight, O oh God, by your spirit to make us clean, O oh God, clean vessels. Because we don't want to be dirty in your presence, God, but we know you can make us clean. We may come dirty, but don't let us stay the same way, God, as we come. But let us leave change and fill with the Holy Spirit and receive a revelation from the heart of God of who you are to us, O oh God. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you all. The Lord says the same. We'll tune in next week, Tuesday. Shalom. And may the peace of God rest and abide upon you until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen.